Hello, this is Jackie Jones and this is uh, Module 1 in Lecture 5, Plain Language Writing, Drafting and Structuring Elements. You will be doing an online activity um, for drafting. When you are undertaking that activity, please bear in mind the following. The importance of structure, having clear communication um, and that, it, that ultimately it is the audience that you must consider. This skill of drafting and doing so in plain language is an integral part of being an effective legal practitioner. So this module about uh, in Lecture 5 is just about the plain language. Where does it emanate from? What does it actually mean? So slide 4 um, really is all about do we just need to uh, refocus on where we've been? Namely, you've come through law school you now at the end of a law degree probably feeling, um, understandably so, that you can think like a lawyer, you can speak like a lawyer and you can write like a lawyer. But drafting um, is a real skill and it does take time and it does take patience and it does take um, a, a positive approach to making um, your document, whether it be a letter, deed, um, any type of transactional matter, will, um, clear and concise for the audience. Slide 5 has a picture of um, Michael Kirby um, who was a former judge of the High Court of Australia and in the Law Society Journal he asked rhetorical questions really um, when he was discussing the plain language movement. Uh, Michael Kirby is a, is a patron of clarity um, and he's a total convert to plain language, so the um, the answers to those questions are from Michael Kirby. No, it's not. What are the elements of plain language? They're set out in slide six. Important to bear in mind that the language structure, content, style, and presentation to um, a particular audience might be very different to that to another audience. So just think of how you might construct a letter with information to a firm of engineers um, in comparison to um, an elderly couple in relation to a will, for example. So a professional body, you might use graphs and um, tables that would assist them in, in the point that's being made. That may not be the case depending upon the subject matter, but importantly, the audience. Peter Butt on slide seven um, identifies six elements of plain language that uh, that really goes to the heart of what we're all about. Importantly for me, it's organising um, what you write in a way that meets the reader's needs, not your needs. All about the, the audience, not about you. And so that the reader is able to grasp on that first reading what it is that is being um, sent to them the outcome that is being proposed or the strategy or the uh, request that is being asked um, to deal with. So the use of um, more words than necessary is very common amongst us lawyers. We like to say lots of words, we like to use lots of words and what we are going to um, ask you to do in in plain language is to reflect on how we can be more concise. So we're literally wanting to take you away from how you've been writing in your core and elective subjects where you may have presented papers and uh, that has um, been for example a um, lot, of, lot of words um, may not have as much structure as you would in a letter um, and you might for example footnote which I'm sure you all do. That's not the case when you are practically using your skills as to what you would do as a legal practitioner. It's not a new trend and in fact the slide number eight just has some quotes. I like the last one, the minute you read something that you can't understand you can almost be sure it was drawn up by a lawyer. Yeah, I think a few people will have a giggle at one. It did start as part of the um, consumer movement back in the 1970s and the father of the plain language movement, as some commentators have called it, uh, Professor Carl Fellensfeld, um, wrote that lawyers have two common failings. One is that they do not write well and the other is that they think they do. I think that really does sum up how we as lawyers approach writing. 
Even our Chief Justice of the High Court, Sir Anthony, Sir Anthony Mason, criticised fellow judges um, talking about judgments not speaking in a language that people readily understand. And I'm sure those of you who are listening to the lecture will have read numerous judgments where it's taken you several goes at reading maybe a sentence or reading the whole judgment, trying to come to grips with what are they actually saying. I certainly, for one, can put my hand up and said that there are judgments that um, I've read and still shake my head and think, well, what do they really mean? And uh, where are they coming from? Where are they going to? And what's the whole um, upshot of the, of the decision? So there are six key reasons to learn plain language, not the least of which is the last one, namely that it's a competency required by the LPAB for students who are seeking admission as legal practitioners in New South Wales. So just bear that in mind, all the subject matters in the PLT subjects are um, all based on the competencies as set out by the LPAB and I referred to that in lecture one. So the reasons is that the, that we can touch on public perception of lawyers is different. I don't know about you, but I think that that has changed. Certainly, even from when I first started in practice, the way we are perceived by the public is different, um, and I think that may have something to do with us being seen as um, uh, charging high fees, um, little access to legal services for, by people who um, have little. Uh, legal resources, um, legal aid is tight and uh, that lawyers will uh, continue um, with matters uh, billing them for financial reasons rather than focusing on what's in the best interests of the client. And clients are uh, another reason as to why we should focus on plain language. They have a right to understand the documents that they um, are being provided. They have a, a right and in fact they demand um, to understand legal advice. Clients do ask questions um, and importantly clients do complain to officials such as the Legal Services Commission and Law Cover. So it is important to bear in mind. It's not that I'm wanting to be a, um, a shock you into um, dealing with anything in a particular way but it's just the reality of the need to be clear and concise in the way that we communicate. There's also a change in the court's focus. The court does acknowledge that people need to understand the effect of their contractual obligations and there are a couple of cases that I'm sure are very familiar to all of you that I've just put on the bottom of slide 13. The judicial approach is another reason why um, we need to be mindful of, the, of writing in plain language style. Certainly the family court judgments are um, drafted in a way that the man in the street, so to speak, can understand um, what is being determined. And judges do, do go to um, uh, judgment school, judgment writing school, I should say, um, and, and various lectures and seminars. Catherine O'Brien um, in 2009 um, indicated that there is a there's a significant degree of judicial support for the use of plain language and in practice you can see that when judicial officers are provided with submissions that are well structured, um, affidavits that are, um, have been filed in trials that are well structured, are clear and concise and enable the reader, namely the judicial officer, to have a, a clear understanding of your client's case and as I said um, the LB competency. On slide 15, I have um, replicated a slide from Meredith Painter when she presented um, a seminar on a guide to prospectus drafting. And I'd like you to take those four points that she said as key lessons because they are as equally applicable to you as what they were to her audience. And namely, plan your draft. Um, you don't uh, do anything without a plan. You wouldn't have drafted a uh, a paper for a core or an elective subject without a plan. So it's essential that you plan a letter, you plan a document, have a structure in mind as to how it's going to flow. Understand your audience, again absolutely essential, and that ability to strike a balance between simplicity and precision takes skill and often takes a number of drafts. So first time round often isn't um, 
the the one that's going to ultimately be the one sent to the uh, client or whoever else it might be intended to go to. Substitute traditional or archaic language with simpler equivalents, all about the plain language, the, the actual words we use, how we put them together, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in Module 2. Consider how to structure the information to aid understanding. Structure is so important. Um, have you got headings? Have you got bullet points? Have you got subparagraphs? Are you using definitions so that you then can use that definition through a document? Um, is there white space on the page so it's not cluttered just with lots and lots of words? Um, think about that when you're drafting your assessment tasks. Slides 16 and 17 are dealing with a case um, that was in the Supreme Court about an estate. It was about a mother's will and um, the definition of the word bequeath, um, to give and bequeath or give, devise and bequeath and um, how the case looked at all the various definitions in that regard. And His Honour um, basically was saying, in a nutshell, slide 17 is, you know, why don't we just use the word give? Why are we using these archaic words? So think about what you're trying to say. How can you say it in a simplified way? And the, the clear point about plain language is that it is a skill and it is more than mere word substitution. Um, it is um, essential to be an effective communicator and to understand the audience and to identify the purpose. But um, importantly, it is um, of benefit to all professionals, even those who don't practice in law. So even though you might be doing PLT and you're going to be admitted, but you don't have um, a desire or an intention to practice as a legal practitioner, uh, the skill of drafting is still one that will um, suit you well in any profession that you um, come in contact with.